Hey, students. So we're beginning module two this week. And um, basically from the first module, you've learned a lot of stuff that was probably the least familiar to you, all the colonial time period stuff. Uh, but module two is really getting to where a lot of you have already learned this information. Some of you from junior high or high school, uh, where you've learned the information about kind of the, the events leading to the American Revolution and so forth. If you remember from module one, uh, one of the last things that was covered was the French and New War, sometimes called the Seven Years War, sometimes textbooks call it the Great War for Empire, really was the first world war in history. Um, it was very expensive uh, to fight. Britain and Prussia were against Austria, Russia, France, and Spain. Uh, Britain and Prussia ended up coming out on top, which was significant big time for world history because uh, France gave up Canada uh, to keep some of their sugar islands in the Caribbean, uh, which forever changed the course of North American history. And then also Britain was able to take from France, uh, India, which had lasting implications for um, the rest of world history in Asia uh, from the late 1700s into um, the 20th century when they get independence in the 1840s. So that was a big time uh, conflict that was fought on, on several different continents. It also was extremely expensive to fight. And so what you end up having is uh, at the end of that war, uh, Britain has spent a ton of its money to uh, fund the, the French Indian War. And so at the end of the French Indian War, uh, when France gave up Canada, the Native Americans that were allied with France and the vast majority uh, of those Native Americans around the Great Lakes fought on the behalf, uh, on, the, on the side of the French. They were pretty angry and this uh, Ottawa war chief named Pontiac had led um, an uprising against the British, basically was almost fought to a draw. The British somewhat prevailed, but not really. Um, they basically agreed to uh, uh, prevent any kind of English colonial settlers from going west of the Appalachians, and that's called the Proclamation Line of 1763, which angered um, some of the American colonists that, on, that fought on behalf of the, of the British during the war because they felt like in their minds if they had fought. Um, they thought the French were defeated, so therefore if the French were defeated, then the Native Americans would have been def defeated, and that land in the High River Valley was actually theirs. Um, Britain thought differently, and so Britain is now majorly in debt to um, uh, itself. And so uh, Britain had basically do been doing something that you, you should remember learning from a module one, what's called solitary neglect. And what that means is uh, the British had kind of ignored the uh, a lot of uh, the eastern colonies um, or the, the eastern seaboard colonies of colonial North America and some in the Caribbean. Uh, the reason for that is they were preoccupied with fighting other colonial wars. Uh, the Caribbean was a big focus of theirs. India was a big focus. The slave trade uh, along the West African coast was a big focus. And so the, the colonists, for the most part, kind of got to govern themselves with the, with the exception of a few time periods. And so um, the colonists had been used to paying taxes. I think a lot of students I've taught over the years think that, oh, the, the colonists never been taxed before. That's not the case. They had been taxed, but they had been taxed locally. They had never been taxed across the ocean. And so local officials that they had appointed in their local colonial legislatures or in their town, uh, town hall meetings and so forth up in colonial New England had decided um, who's going to serve and those are the elected representatives are the ones that actually decide uh, how much taxes they pay and when they pay those taxes. So when Britain comes out of the Seven Years' War, the French Indian War, whichever one you want to call it, they realize it is time to reform things. Um, because of Pontiac's Rebellion, the British realize that they're going to have to house about 10,000 British troops, give or take, uh, on the uh, North American frontier around the Appalachians and Great Lakes region of North America. And so as a result of that, um, that costs money because you have to pay for the troops to go across the Atlantic. You have to feed them. You have to clothe them. You have to build housing for them. Um, and of course, you've got to pay them. And so uh, the British naturally thought that it was perfectly reasonable to tax the American colonists to pay for their own defense against Native Americans. That's not an unreasonable uh, expectation. The problem is the British never actually communicated the reasoning uh, behind them actually taxing the colonists. Um, so reason why that they wanted to reform this colonial system is they're broke and they've got to bring in new revenue sources for um, their empire. So they're going to have to figure out ways to uh, reimburse themselves uh, from the war cost. Um, as 
uh, another connection later in history is that you know U.S. is, is going to be uh, spent a lot of money for World War One and World War Two, um, so that's going to uh, need to uh, bring in additional revenue. Of course, we we funded World War One and World War Two much differently. Um, so there's three things about mercantilism that you need to understand going forward to understand why Britain did some of the things that they did. Number one is that in, in the eyes of mercantilism and this economic philosophy before capitalism comes about uh, with the Industrial Revolution is that colonists and really colonies are there to benefit the mother country. And so they're not there to benefit themselves. Um, they're benefit the mother country being Great Britain. Um, secondly, uh, wealth equals power. So how much gold and silver you have in your treasury equals power. Well, since Britain and France um, had fought uh, in North American continent along with the other European countries mentioned previously, um, they were broke. And so Britain thought, well, if our treasury is empty, then we need to bring in additional revenue so that we can be powerful again. And then lastly, you always want to uh, export more than you import. And so in their minds, the, the colonies were there to provide raw materials that they could export uh, to other other nations. And they were pretty angry when they found out that the American colonists at times had smuggled with their enemies, such as France, particularly in the Caribbean or what they called the West Indies. So the big problem is Americans were used to basically doing their own thing, uh, taxing themselves, governing themselves, with the exception of a few uh, brief moments where, where Britain tried to have greater control over them. And so it was not unreasonable for the, the British to, to expect the American colonists to sh uh, shoulder some of the uh, expenses for their defense, but the problem is they never communicated that. And um, if you look right here at this, this next slide, I, I kind of put a, a blending of an American and British flag because really before um, the late 1760s and the 1770s, uh, colonists in the English colonies were proud to be British. Um, they, they viewed themselves very much as British subjects. They were proud to be British over French, uh, over Russian, over German, any other um, European uh, group. Um, and, and so there was no idea of, at this time, right after the Seven Years' War, of even thinking themselves as different from, from any other British subject. They viewed themselves as British. They read British newspapers. They wear British clothing. Um, they, had, they brought British furniture. Um, they drank British tea. Um, of course, the British acquired in, in, in Asia, but basically they did that um, because they, that's what they did culturally as, as British. And so it's not until as you get right before the American Revolution that you start seeing more and more colonists consider themselves Americans and not British. All right. So taxation, as you, you may have heard previously in other uh, U.S. history courses that you may have taken in, in your educational career, you hear the big slogan, no taxation, all the representation. And so um, what ends up happening is after the, the Seven Years' War, the British decide that they're going to bring an additional revenue taxes from a federal government level, not at a local level, to tax the American colonists. And so um, in the colonist eyes, they were like, well, there's no way to check how parliament taxes. There's no representative government. Uh, the reason why there's no representative government in the American colonies is because they actually didn't have representatives in parliament. And so what they wanted is they actually wanted elected representatives from the, the 13 colonies to go to parliament uh, and vote on their behalf, uh, similar to what we have in, in the Senate and the House of Representatives today. Um, so they thought that the parliament did not have their best interests where local colonial legislatures or local town hall meetings, um, that they actually did have their best interest because if, if they didn't, then, then they could be voted out of office by the adult men. Okay. Um, so they wanted this actual representation in parliament, uh, particularly. So between 1763, when the seven years war, uh, technically ended with the treaty of Paris, 1763 to 1765, there's going to be some changes that basically, uh, take place, uh, with Britain driving the French out, out of Canada, um, British decided to give up on solitary neglect. And so um, this is a drastic change in their policy. They had tried it previously with the Dominion of England and, and some other instances, but it, it, it was met with colonial resistance and it ended up failing. Uh, this time it's going to be uh, much more different um, and it's going to last for a longer period of time until eventually the colonists rebel and win their independence. Um, one thing, though, that did kind of frustrate the American colonists for the first time was during the war, uh, first it's like George Washington was a colonial colonel but ends up getting demoted uh, to a major in the British Army. And so the British really had contempt for the American colonists, the colonial militia that had fought for the British, and they kind of looked down upon them, thought they were better uh, 
than the American colonists. And so the American colonists kind of had a chip on their shoulder and resented them for that. So it's not that 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 solely led to the American Revolution. It's a culmination of things that led to the American Revolution. But that's just one um, annoyance of many that the Americans had against the British. So one of the things you have um, is at the very end of the French Indian War, the British passed this Revenue Act of 1762. And basically what it did is it, it tried to strengthen imperial authority. Um, the act tightened up the collection of trade duties, which is basically just trade taxes, um, which colonial merchants had evaded for decades. And the reason why the colonial merchants had evaded this for decades is basically they had bribed the um, um, tax officials, kind of like the IRS today, It'd be like somebody bribing an IRS official to um, uh, overlook uh, you not paying your taxes on, on your small business or something. John Hancock, one of the wealthiest guys uh, before the American Revolution, um, he had made a lot of money by, by bribing officials and smuggling stuff without taxes. He was already in business. He was just avoiding paying a business tax. So um, one of the things that kind of annoyed American colonists and really affected New York particularly because New York was um, the most prominent harbor in the colonists. Uh, Philadelphia was the most populated city at the time, but New York was a close second. Um, New York Harbor is typically where they brought in British ships uh, with troops. The troops would uh, go from New York and then go up to um, the Appalachian region, the Great Lakes region for colonial uh, defense in these colonial forts. Um, and so really the Quartering Act that ends up getting passed affected New Yorkers first um, and then later it affects Massachusetts when they start kind of getting routing. And so um, Pontiac's War is what caused the Proclamation of 1763 to develop. So if you look right here at this map, you can see basically from the green on the right that uh, this is where primarily where the colonists were settled. You notice that even up here in, in uh, western and upstate New York, there's not colonists, and that's because the mighty Iroquois Confederation was up there. Um, remember them from the Beaver Wars, a uh, very powerful Indian Confederation, arguably the most powerful Indian Confederation in American history. So they had weakened themselves um, in, in previous conflicts in the 1600s. And so um, they had prevented settlement in upstate New York and western New York, which will change after the American Revolution. But you kind of see where this um, proclamation line was proposed. And so there were people particularly Daniel Boone, who led uh, people through the Cumberland Gap of North Carolina and moved into Kentucky and uh, kind of created the town of Boonesboro, hence after Daniel Boone. And uh, they uh, had, had settled there. And basically when the British troops that were on the frontier would find settlers, they would send them back east um, across the Appalachians. The problem is, is that it's so spar uh, spread out and difficult to, to even find anybody it wasn't like they were roaming the countryside for uh, American colonists that had gone there illegally. Kentucky also was was kind of interesting. It was un, un, primarily uninhabited by Native Americans. Um, neither the Cherokee to the south or the Shawnee to the north could really con effectively control Kentucky. It wasn't primary. Most of the state really wasn't settled by Native Americans. It was used for hunting ground uh, by, by various tribes. And so that's why when Daniel Boone and his settlers go through the Cumberland Gap, they're able to settle in Kentucky relatively easily, but um, as Native American hunting parties come across them, that's when they uh, developed conflict. Another map of um, uh, the proclamation line of 1763, and you can see uh, in the orange, these proposed colonies um, uh, from the original 13 colonies. Yeah, it's weird to think of Virginia and present day Wisconsin, uh, but that was one of their proposals um, that they had in place. Let's look at Britain's debt. Um, during the war, um, basically when the Seven Years' War officially began in 1756, even though the French Indian War began two years before in 1754, they're about $75 million in debt. Uh, but that shoots up by the end of the war to $133 million. So it almost doubled. Um, and so they want to pay that back. And basically the interest on that debt that they had borrowed to uh, fund the war from countries like Holland and others, they have 60% of their national budget. So the solution is you got to post taxes. And the guy that they uh, put kind of in charge of this is the, the British Prime Minister, George Greenville. Now, today, the British Prime Minister is much like the American president. Um, the king was still the most powerful entity in uh, Great Britain. But George Greenville, the prime minister, was probably the most sec second powerful person in the empire. Um, so George Greenville wants to reform uh, the taxation policy and uh, kind of uh, bring additional revenue. So the, one of the things that he had done 
uh, from his time um, in office when he first came to office in the early 1760s. Um, they had uh, uh, passed this thing called Roots of Assistance. Um, they also, he had the Proclamation Line of 1763 passed. The Sugar Act was really the first attempt at trying to gain revenue, but it didn't really bring in enough revenue to even be worth anything. And so it was kind of a flop. The Currency Act was to prevent uh, any kind of colonial legislature from printing their own paper money. They had to use basically minted uh, uh, gold and silver coins of, of Great Britain. Quartering Act caused, caused quite a bit of controversy in New York, but it doesn't until you get into the early 1770s where it starts affecting other places, particularly Boston area for um, getting rowdy. The Stamp Act of 1765 is really the first true attempt at gaining revenue. And this is will lead to kind of an upset firestorm in the colonies that we'll talk about. Definitely have to know the Stamp Act. Um, so what's interesting is that the American colonists had been kind of uh, not used to paying as, as heavy taxes. Actually, if you lived in uh, on the British Isles, you paid five times as much as taxes as American colonists. So you're thinking, well, well, then why would the Americans get that upset if, if subjects they're living in Great Britain paying five times as much as that? Well, the reason is, is they weren't used to it. It's everything that you're used to. If you're used to paying heavier taxes, raising it slightly is not going to uh, get you as upset. Um, but if you had paid very little taxes or had paid only local taxes, not something you're getting charged from a, um, a government across the ocean, um, and it, it makes your tax bill go up quite a bit, then you're going to be much more upset. It's all about what you're used to. And so if you think it this way, let's say um, that the state government issued where, well, for you've been able to um, drive with, with talking on your phone and you could text on your phone without consequence. So instead of like gradually implementing some things, they just made it where passed a law immediately that you could not even drive in your car with your cell phone whatsoever. Well, that'd be a drastic jump from then doing a small step would be, all right, you can't text and drive. Then another step would be, oh, you, you can't talk on your phone um, or you have to have a, a, a hands-free device such as a Bluetooth headset or something to be able to talk on your phone. They go from, from basically having free reign to automatically no cell phone in your car at all, even when you're traveling. So that that would be kind of like what the American colonists felt. Uh, you'd be obviously upset about that, and so would uh, the American colonists. So Currency Act of 764, as I mentioned previously, banned paper money. Uh, did it hurt? Uh, yes, it hurt. Um, because oftentimes gold and silver was, was tough to come by from the British government. Uh, and, and a lot of times the British merchants controlled a lot of the gold and silver within the empire. And so the American merchants didn't have as much and they wanted to be able to pay, uh, pay with paper money. Uh, and that was not, not feasible with this act. Who did it benefit? It benefited the British merchants who controlled primarily most of the gold and silver. Well, guess what? Who's serving in parliament? The British merchants primarily. So they're passing laws that, that, that suits their interest. Now, um, if you're like me, um, a lot of us Americans are addicted to sugar. Uh, and for the longest time, my favorite way to consume sugar was none other than Dr. Pepper. Um, and so I've actually given up Dr. Pepper at the new year. It's been difficult this year, but uh, uh, one of the best ways that, that sugar's ever been used, in my opinion. And uh, so if you don't like Dr. Pepper, just don't tell me about it. Um, so the Sugar Act of 1764 basically was just tag on sugar. Um, sugar was uh, the, the really one of the biggest revenue for all European colonial empires in the Caribbean area. Um, it's basically like petroleum of the 16 and 17 and, and into the early 1800s. It is the oil for that day and age. It's one of the most sought after and desirable natural resources. Of course, it's, it's grown. The labor is very intensive. It's also uh, which leads to the growth of, of slavery in the West Hemisphere tremendously. And you use sugar to uh, put in a uh, coca uh, drink, which it becomes chocolate, because cho chocolate's actually bitter. And if you add sugar to it, it makes it sweet. Um, they would they would use it to make rum. Rum is an alcohol that is uh, uh, comes from sugar. It's got a little bit much more sugary flavor. Uh, molasses, if you've ever had uh, molasses, it's it, it's kind of like a consistency of honey. It's a little darker, uh, but it's kind of like a syrup, uh, like maple syrup, but but tastes a little bit different. And so it was a very popular thing to consume on bread and biscuits. Who did it hurt? Um, it really hurt the West Indies. Well, we're not talking about the original thirteen colonies there. 
So Sugar Act didn't create that big of a fuss. Uh, but it was the first attempt to really raise revenue in the colonies, and it was a big failure. All right. So um, the big objection for by the colonists is that, hey, taxes are supposed to come directly from the people. That's what we've done from basically 1607 or 1620 if you're in New England, um, all the way up to 1760s. Um, also, the thing is that really upset them is that they didn't have local courts. And so instead of being tried by a jury of your peers, which is what we have today, and I've served on two juries myself, uh, been jury for foreman both times, you were charged under vice admiralty court. And so basically what that meant is you're more likely to have a biased jury. So Britain's argument, hey, but Parliament's law supersedes the colonial law. Co colonists argument were like, well, we should have uh, representation in Parliament. So, but here's a big one, the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act has been on um, every test um, related to this module that I've ever given. Um, it's also been on the uh, AP U.S. History exam every year. It's a big deal because it's the first time the colonists kind of united in resistance against uh, something passed by Parliament uh, across the 13 colonies. And so basically what it was was a tax on paper goods. Um, so if you were getting married, you have to buy, you have to get a marriage license, then that a tax on it. If you were buying uh, stamps, which is where the name comes from, to mail something, um, you had to pay ta uh, a tax on that. If you were buying cards, um, like to play with, then you had to pay tax, you had to uh, have a stamp on it. If you were a lawyer, any kind of legal document had to have this stamp on it, and that's those additional tax. So what's kind of interesting, I've heard one historian say, you really upset two groups in the, in the college you don't want to upset. Uh, the playing cards upset a lot of the sailors who were kind of rough and rowdy and rough around the edges because they don't want to pay a stamp tax on, on their playing cards. And then secondly, you upset the, some of the most educated people in the colonies, which was the attorneys, who had to buy most of the legal documents and stamp taxes. So not, uh, not a good thing. Um, so Parliament passed this and not the colonies, which upset them. And like I mentioned previously about the Quartering Act. They also sets up new courts. And so from this, you end up having kind of a famous, um, or if you're a British, an infamous group um, that was seen as very radical called the Sons of Liberty. And so this group basically started passing around colonial propaganda against the Stamp Act. And so like, hey, don't buy these playing cards. Hey, don't buy these stamps or these legal documents. Let's, let's boycott it. So um, anyway, that's what the, actually the stamp looked like um, and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> the um, current occupying British general at the time, General Thomas Gage, is who's the one that asked for the Quartering Act. And it, but as I mentioned previously, primarily affects New York originally. So what is virtual representation? Because this is something acclaimed by the British Parliament that uh, upset the uh, American colonists. And they were saying, well, yes, you don't have representation in Parliament directly from the 13 colonies, but what you do have is that Parliament virtually represents you um, across the entire British Empire. Yeah, right. All right. So then let's get from 1765 to 1770. These next six years are going to be kind of interesting. So these are examples of um, stamp tax, talking about stamp tax propaganda. It's going to lead you to death and so forth. And uh, from the Pennsylvania Journal, local uh, newspaper in the, in the Pennsylvania area um, against the stamp tax and so forth. So what did the colonists end up doing? This is huge, the Stamp Act Congress. Um, so out of the 13 colonies, nine of them sent delegates to New York City in October 1765 and basically met to discuss, all right, what do we do about this situation? So here's the things they protested. They feel like they lost rights and liberties okay, by not being able to tax themselves locally. Um, loss of trial by jury, which was true. Uh, taxation without representation, so they wanted representation in Parliament. And so the solution was, well, if Brit we're going to catch British's attention, then we need to boycott British goods. And the reason why that was significant is because the American original 13 colonies made up about 25% of the entire British Empire's revenue. Um, a lot of settlers had come, as you remember from reading Module 1, uh, because the headright system and, and the indentured servanthood system and so forth, and the chance to own land and so forth. And so there's a ton of colonists there, a lot of potential consumers, also a ton of natural resources that were available. Um, these are certain other drawings of the of protests during the, the Stamp Act time. 
they would burn effigies of like a uh, tax official. So basically like a scarecrow of a, of a tax official. And so you have um, the Sons of Liberty. Of course, Samuel Adams um, is, is the most famous leader of the Sons of Liberty. Um, and mostly he's known now because of um, the local uh, uh, Sam Adams beer, which actually he, he was uh, somebody who brewed beer, but actually was a failure at it. So it's not like he was the company he started back in the 1700s. I've had a lot of students over the years have asked me that. So basically what they're doing is they send colonial propaganda documents throughout the colonies like stamp act tax sucks, uh, boycott British goods, or, you know, this, this is ridiculous, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Um, so it affects pretty much all 13 colonies, even though only nine sent delegates to the uh, to New York city for the stamp act Congress. Um, it, it affects throughout the colonies. Now did the average Joe farmer in say Georgia or South Carolina or, you know, Pennsylvania and central Pennsylvania, was it affected? Well, if they had any kind of legal documents, then yes, but a lot of it did affect, but it did affect a lot of the people in the cities and some of the most educated. So these, all these dots represent areas where there were Stamp Act protests that emerged. And so you can see there's a dot in all 13 colonies. Um, now, Maine at that time was not um, part of uh, what is not its own independent colony. It was part of Massachusetts at the time. All right. So the boycott, basically what that means is you refuse to buy something. So it'd be like today we boycotting a large retailer uh, like Amazon, Walmart, or Target or something. That would be boycotting their goods. Um, these protests or people marching, they were a little uh, at times a little aggressive with burning effigies. And later um, uh, tax officials uh, might be tarred and feathered, which is uh, terrible. And then what you have is what's called the committees of correspondence. <clears throat> One thing to understand culturally at this time was a big deal was taverns. Taverns were much like a coffee shop today. They were a place of gathering, a place of social uh, interaction. And uh, people met there to basically um, correspond and talk about the issues of the day. A lot of, uh, because these, a lot of these American colonists were the most literate people in the British empire because of the uh, religious influence. And, and if you read in module one, um, for instance, the Puritans want everybody to be able to read the Bible. And so they had the most, some of the most educated people. Um, now it doesn't mean every farmer out in the countryside could read, but more people could read in terms of percentage of the population and pretty much anywhere else in the world at that time. And so you had a more literate population. So you could send this, this is, these committees of correspondence would be like people spreading information through Twitter today. Um, and so if you look at, um, from the boycotts right here on this chart, um, right here on the left chart, um, this was the anticipated revenue they thought we were going to bring from the stamp acts because so many people uh, boycotted and protested. The the uh, right one right there is um, what they actually brought in, and the expense of it was uh, very costly. So the parliament's like, they're looking at numbers. They're like, well, this isn't worth it. So they eventually decided to get rid of the stamp tax. So like I mentioned, it started primarily in the cities where you have some of the most educated people. Um doesn't mean you didn't have educated people that weren't in the cities. You had a lot of very educated planters that live out in the countryside or, or um, small town attorneys or, or whatnot. But um, um, you tend to have more attorneys in the cities um, and other occupations as well. So start out as economic grievances. And then um, really early on, there's, there's no particular leader. Um, it's not like you have a, um, very influential and well-known leaders such as like Dr. King or George Washington or uh, Abraham Lincoln or, uh, uh, you know, Webb Du Bois or something like that, or Booker T. Washington or uh, uh, Eugene Debs or something later in American history. Um, basically, it ends up kind of a lot of the founding fathers end up or had law degrees of some sort. So um, really what's inspiring this is you have to understand what the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment really had challenged governmental philosophy for the first time in world history. And basically what that was is in their minds, um, because of John Locke's writings and his treatise on, on government, is before they thought that um, power came from God. And so since the, the king was divinely appointed in their eyes, um, then, then you should respect it because it, it, their power comes from God. Well, John Locke challenged that. Uh, John Locke was actually a committed Christian, but um, he said, no, really power comes from the consent of the governed. You only have the power that you have because uh, we give it to you. And so he also is the one that said that that uh, people are endowed uh, by their creator certain um, rights, uh, particularly unalienable rights. And one of those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. As you'll remember later in history, Thomas Jefferson's going to uh, 
plagiarized part of that and life later in the pursuit of happiness. Um, and so pamphlets and newspapers helped spread it. And back then that was their entertainment was, was reading. Uh, I know that uh, nowadays there is a tons of entertainment back then. If you could read, that was your entertainment. Um, so the stamp act gets repealed within a year. So it worked. Then this guy, Lord Rockingham, replaced George Greenville as prime minister because it was such a flop. Uh, Parliament got rid of their prime minister, George Greenville. So basically what when they do repeal the stamp tax, um, Parliament issues is what's called the Declaratory Act. They're like, all right, well, we'll we're going to repeal the stamp tax, but we're going to declare that we have the right to tax you whether you like it or not. So um, eventually Lord Rockingham is out. They decided to bring back William Pitt. Now, William Pitt's famous guy who had um, really influenced the uh, French Indian War by um, telling the British Army, hey, instead of going after uh, the French in the frontier, why don't we go straight for Quebec and Montreal? And that ends up winning the French Indian War uh, for the British in Canada. Um, and so he ends up uh, becoming ill, ends up dying. His his uh, younger son, William Pitt the Younger, ends up becoming uh, prime minister later, but that's after the American Revolution. And so William Pitt would have probably set them on wiser course, um, very uh, smart, influential uh, British prime minister in the 1700s. Uh, but because he all falls ill, Charles Townsend is the man. Um, so what did the Townsend decide to do? Well, when they need revenue, because they're still broke, mercantilism is still uh, wealth equals power. And so he imposed new taxes with at the time they called duties. Um, it's just another word for taxes on uh, instead of just paper products, he did it on paper, paint, glass, and tea. Uh, now tea was the most consumed liquid outside of water in the colonies. And so it'd be like uh, a big time major tax on coffee today. Uh, we as Americans are addicted to caffeine. So, and like I said previously, um, that this revenue was supposed to go to paying the salaries of troops and, and other imperial officials. So um, basically, when the New York uh, Colonial Assembly refused to uh, comply with the Quartering Act, um, Parliament passed this Restraining Act that basically suspended the legislature from even meeting and be like, uh, in Arkansas or Texas, the federal government uh, shutting down the state legislature in those states. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is Colonists were okay with some taxes. They knew that taxes were a necessity to function. Any society throughout history that has been a civilization has had to pay taxes to a king or a, a monarch of some sort or, or some type of, of government entity. So taxes are a, a fact of life. I was taught growing up, there's three things in life you have no control over. Living, because um, you can't control being born, dying, and paying taxes. So um, same thing with this particular instance. instance. So one of, the, one of the things that become in, interesting, and I had to write a paper on this guy in uh, college, a guy named John Dickinson, um, but he's one of our most influential and famous founding fathers, but he wrote an anonymous letter, and it was called Letter from a Farmer in Pennsylvania, because he was a, a fairly wealthy farmer there. Um, of course, we know today it was actually written by him, but at the time it was anonymous. Um, and so he questioned us, okay, so what's the intent of this taxes? Um, you know, taxes themselves aren't bad, but he questioned the intent. And if Britain would have explained that it was for colonial defense and to fund that and pay for that, they may have not had any issues, but they never actually communicated that. And so yet again, stamp tax boycott worked. Round two, they tried it with the Townsend Acts. They boycott British goods a second time. Remember, they make up 25% of the revenue for the British government. And the Townsend Act uh, ends up getting... Uh, down as well. And so um, one thing to, to understand too, and, and the role of women leading up to the American Revolution is women played a very important role, just like men did. So you have the sons of liberty, you also have the da daughters of liberty. And how women really helped organize this is that women would get together and what would have uh, what's called spinning bees. Now these are, these are pretty common. Uh, knitting is a pretty monotonous, boring job. And so, but if you're knitting and, and around some of your closest women friends, then ends, what ends up becoming a monotonous, boring task ends up becoming a delightful uh, day of, of social interaction. And so these spinning bees, they began knitting uh, home, home spun American clothes instead of British clothes uh, because the British wanted them to send their wool back to the British fact or, you know, what becomes into textile factories and they would send it back with manufactured goods. Um, so they did that to help boycott British goods. The Daughters of Liberty played an important role in that. 
Um, and um, also they, they Sons of Liberty started with the Stamp Act uh, tax. Daughters of Liberty began the next year with the Townsend Acts. Um, and so really for the first time, those that, that opposed this began to refer to themselves as patriots. Of course, that ends up being kind of in some ways the mascot of the American Revolution and, and it's a mascot now for the New England Patriots uh, and so forth. But um, one of the things that, that Britain responded with is they're like, well, if you're going to start acting rowdy about this and having all this protest and, and have these boycotts, well, we're going to send more troops. And so um, it's kind of like you're reinstituting law and order by sending in more British troops. And British, Britain had one of the most powerful militaries in the world. They definitely had the most powerful Navy. They probably didn't have the most powerful army, but it still was, was one, one of the top you know, three or four most powerful armies in the world. So what ends up happening is the Townsend Acts passed in 1766, 1767. Eventually they get rid of it. Um, a new guy comes in as prime minister. Um, and so uh, the Charles Townsend is out and this guy named Lord North comes in. Um, and so really the reason why Britain ends up uh, repealing it they were going to try to hold out to the boycott, but the problem is, is they were losing out on American food. Uh, the original 13 colonies provide a lot of the grain and corn and other food crops that the, the British people uh, who began working in the textile uh, mills, among other things, in the 1700s needed to, to sustain themselves. The thing, though, that did keep is the tax on tea. And that is something to remember as we get to the Boston Tea Party. So the boycott gets called off, and now... Life is back to business as usual. But then you have in, in 1770, the Boston Massacre. Um, it's portrayed very well in the um, um, HBO miniseries called John Adams, which I, I love. It's won a bunch, of, a bunch of awards. And it's based off Dave McKellick's uh, biography of John Adams, one of my favorite presidents. But um, it was interesting is that John Adams actually defended the British soldiers. And John Adams, um, he definitely certainly had his faults. I mean, he was a very moral man and um, always wanted to defend what was right. And he actually defended the British soldiers and actually got them acquitted. So how in the world did he get British soldiers acquitted? Well, the, the story goes is there was a British sentry on duty and um, he began getting heckled as rope makers and other people that worked on the docks uh, began getting off of work. It was in the middle of the winter, the snow on the ground's cold and began heckling uh, the soldier. Um, because of this rowdy crowd, he ended up calling in for reinforcements, and they brought basically a whole uh, a platoon of uh, British soldiers. As they're lined up there, they were taking the harassment and so forth and, and getting started getting pelted with snowballs. Um, but what ends up happening that uh, uh, forever changed the course, I guess you could argue, American history, um, is that uh, somebody um, hit one of the British officers with a club. And by the way, some of the members of the crowd were yelling, um, to the British soldiers, uh, fire, trying to provoke them, while the British officer told them not to fire. Well, uh, one of the young British soldiers got clubbed in the head with one of the rope maker's clubs. Uh, when he fell, his, his firearm dis uh, discharged. And uh, as you can imagine, when you're, you're in a nervous situation, um, the uh, British soldiers are firing in the crowd and five of the uh, uh, members of the crowd are killed. Now, one guy that has uh, made a much bigger deal in history later in the 1850s was a guy named Crispus Attucks. He was a young, uh, free black living in um, Boston at the time. And so if you look at some of the original paintings of the Boston Massacre, he's not even really mentioned. Uh, but then the 1850s, there's a new drawing or painting of the Boston Massacre. He's on the front row getting shot right through the neck. And that's because it was uh, an abolitionist drawing of, of the Boston Massacre to try to uh, persuade people that, hey, um, African-Americans were some of the earliest patriots in our country. And so sometimes history gets a little bit changed to meet a certain uh, agenda, uh, even though the abolitionist agenda was correct in history and ends up uh, prevailing. Um, they use that to, uh, whether he was the first one shot in the throat, who knows, um, but they, they kind of use it for private. Um, so anyway, you end up having this high tension and um, Boston Massacre ends up uh, taking place. So this right here is a drawing by Paul Revere uh, of the British, uh, what they viewed as a massacre. And so you look right here, the British look like the aggressors. These are peaceful looking colonists on the left. That's actually not how it went down in the historical. 
history. And so John Adams defended the soldiers and the reason why they were acquitted is because they were provoked by the crowd. So, um, and it was interesting, John Adams ends up going to represent um, Massachusetts at the first uh, Continental Congress. So obviously he ends up becoming a patriot himself and one of our most important founding fathers. Um, but at this time he knew that they were actually provoked and he did not support anarchy or, or violence or anything like that. Um, so anyway, this is from an eyewitness account. If you want to read, uh, this is from the trial that John Adams defended the, the soldiers. Anyway, this is about those that died. This is a, a Sons of Liberty propaganda. 